Hello, my name is Andy Meir and I'm a Professor of Ethics and Emerging Technologies at the University of the West of Scotland where I direct the Creative Futures Institute. Uh, this video is in relation to a essay I've written for Taylor and Francis Publishers who this month are publishing an edition on sport that's focused particularly on doping and cycling in line with the Tour de France that's happening in the next few weeks. Uh, within this thematic month a range of articles are published that deal with the history, the politics, the sociology, the science and technology of doping. And it's been an interesting process to read some of the backlog of articles within the publisher for the last four years. It's just, the research is just enormous in this area. Doping uh, is perhaps one of the central issues for the world of sport today. It has been for quite a long time. But these essays reveal really just how far the research has come but also how much more is left to do. So philosophers are still dope, uh, debating the, the definition of doping, we're still figuring out what this means, and that becomes harder as the technology evolves too. Would surgical implants constitute doping? Would laser eye surgery include, be included? What sorts of things are athletes likely to do that are gonna change that definition? At the same time, how is society going to develop its relationship to body modification and enhancement in a way that changes that as well? So these are quite, challenging issues, not just for sports, but for society too. And yet doping is still one of those topics where people aren't sure how much is going on. How big a problem is this for the world of sport? How much of it is a public health problem too? So many of the articles grapple with the complexity of this, given the vast uncertainty of really what's taking place. And there are considerable differences of opinions about how, how bad that is. Now the Tour de France has always been rife with discussions about doping. Uh, one of the essays uh, reminds us of the 1998 sit-down where riders protested the police raids on the Festina team uh, by sitting down in the middle of the 17th leg, um, just I think in complete dismay at the way in which cyclists are treated. And for me one of the key issues has always been how athletes give up their privileges just for sport, freedom of, of movement, uh, physical uh, privacy is lost in the pursuit of, of drug testers and, and dopers. And one of the questions I think rises, arises from this is how far we're prepared to go to test people for d drugs and doping. Now you might say we'll go as far as we need to. We need to make sure there's a, a level playing field and that the uh, competitors are playing on the, in, the, in the same sort of way. But um, we're already testing kids in high schools. How far do we test people before we start to think this is this has just gone too far, we need another strategy. And so many of these articles do gra grapple with that complexity and reveal to us just how far uh, the anti-doping authorities still have to go to really address this issue. And um, you know they've got a tough job ahead of them. And I think the, the biggest problem they face is that the, uh, the world's moving on too. You know, it's not just a question of what's happening in sports anymore. We live in a world where t 20 years ago people were up in arms about GM products. Today people are less concerned about that. So there's a sense in which technologies that are new, that are controversial, become accepted or more acceptable. And in a world where we have uh, genetic screening, genetic pre-implantation um, pre genetic diagnosis, ways in which we are tampering with biology before day one, before birth, then what sense will there really be of having a, a policy that tries to protect people from enhancements or to ensure some natural playing field where athletes compete? I think this has really got to go uh, back to basics and really think about what sports are all about. We care about seeing extraordinary performances. We put athletes in a position where they have to use technology to do this. In fact, many sports are constituted by technology. Um, they wouldn't make sense without them. So we kind of just quibble over the details as to which technologies we like and which we don't. But aside from that, um, we, we get lost in the concerns about harm and, and the risks to health and so on, which have been part of the history of the doping debate and its broader contextualization within the doping war. So I think when we consider where this might go, where all this research may take us, um, a number of the articles point to the fact that this intractable problem is only likely to get worse. Um, so we need to rethink the, the problem. We need to rethink our approach to the problem uh, and consider what other strategies there might be to level the playing field or create a, a, a kind of level playing field that we value. Uh, if that means allowing everyone access to everything, uh, that might be a better solution. 
That doesn't mean that we encourage people to take ridiculous risks with their health, but we perhaps monitor the health risks of performance enhancing technologies. We set up a world pro-doping agency as well as the world anti-doping agency, the responsibility of which will be to invest into safer technologies, allow athletes access to um, safer, more informed ways of performance enhancing for, for their sports. If we do that, then, then yes, some athletes may get harmed anyway, uh, but they might get harmed less, um, and that seems to be a better situation. So enjoy the articles, enjoy reading just how far this body of research has come in 40 years, uh, and just how, how much more difficult the problem is today than it was back then. Thanks very much.